Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm your host, Lisa. Um, I'm here today with my very special guest, uh, Venkat. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Scorpio Season. I'm here with my special guest, Lisa. <laughs> uh, hey, Venkat. Do you have... Oh, so today we're talking about the letter N, right? Um, yes. Before we begin, do you have a... did you bring a snack? Yes, I did. So today I have mixed nuts. Mixed nuts. Okay, cool. Which I made myself. <laughs> did you pick the nuts yourself or crack them or you mixed it i mean they're raw unroasted nuts so i kind of roasted them and salted them myself and i was uh-huh. gonna cheat and just eat one sort of nut that doesn't need roasting like a walnut but that felt like cheating and it felt like if i wanted to do nuts i had to have at least two kinds of nuts in there i see, so. I, see. <laughs> I have weird honesty standards with myself yeah i can tell i I appreciate it though the um level of like truthiness or at least like yeah do you have a snack uh yeah i brought this is why i was running a little late today i made nachos Um, oh you made nachos okay wow that's (laughs) it's basically the only thing well it's a very common staple in this household um but still, you, I think you put in more effort, so you win the snack face-off for the week. <laughs> so you have nachos, I have nuts. Okay, nuts and nachos. And what's our first topic? It's um, networking, right? All right. So, um, uh, I think I remember when we talked about that and put that on the list, it was because I said something like um, networking is pointless or doesn't work or something, right? Is that why we put it there? Yeah, Yeah, I think that's right. I don't remember what episode that was, but yes, you did. You made a comment about how, right. Do you want to expand on that a little more? Um. Yeah. So there's this um, video I watched uh, like, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, really long ago, when LinkedIn was first a thing and everybody was getting on LinkedIn. And it was this uh, sort of satire parody video of people just going around, like handing each other business cards and linking in with each other. And it's all a bunch of losers and them connecting with each other doesn't do any of them any good because nobody has any connections to anybody who can actually do anything for them. Like, you know, give them a job, give them anything. So it's like a lot of networking feels like that. And uh, now about 15 years later, it only feels worse. So it can't have been 15. When did LinkedIn start? Actually, LinkedIn started pretty early, like 2003 or four, I think. So yeah, yeah it, it, it was a while ago. And so that's uh, sort of one reason I kind of like, I'm not a fan of networking. And there's other reasons, of course, there's like people who, I don't know, specialize in it almost. And they're really good at it. They make connections, blah, blah, blah. But they're the worst kind of people ever. And they become the scenesters who infest a scene. And they don't add any value anywhere. They're like just load. And the I think the third thing I want to say about why I dislike networking is it becomes less and less useful the older you get. So when you're young, you're networking with other young people, all of whom can do nothing for each other. So it's useless in one way. When you're older, networking becomes useless in another way because you're like already kind of like well-defined and logged in and there's not really much anybody else can do to like open doors for you and uh, sort of make big opportunities for you. And like maybe if you're an actor looking for like a break in Hollywood, maybe you're 70 when you get your first big break and you have like a, you know, role as an elderly person in a sitcom and then you become famous. Like that could happen, right? In some professions it happens. Like I'm thinking of like, uh, the woman who played the mother in Everybody Loves Raymond, that's the first time I saw her and I looked her up and um, she basically wasn't really known at all before then. Like just a minor, really low time actor. Uh, But she must have been like 65, 70 when she got the role of the mom. So yeah, that's the counter example that proves the rule that networking can actually do something for you as you get older. But for me, for most kinds of life you might be living, Networking is generally kind of like annoying, useless shit that people tell you to do. And the people who are good at it are just annoying. So I have a lot of uh, (laughs) pent up resentment against the networking culture. 
I hear that. Yeah. It sounds like, um, I feel like I, part of what I, I think you're hearing, I hear you saying is that, um, networking really depends on like, if you think of the people as like the substrate and networking is like sort of mining for gold or like gold digging, um, the, the, you got to make sure you're digging in fertile ground. So if you like hang out with like all your friends, that's kind of like going to like the sandy beach looking for gold. Like no one's seen gold <laughs> there in a million years. Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna like strike it rich necessarily just like digging through unproductive land. Um, and then it sounds like the people that you call good at networking aren't necessarily good at hitting gold in terms of finding value for themselves. Like it sounds like what you mean by networking, you mean some amount of just exploring the territory. Like they're just good at figuring out what the land looks like because they- Not just any territory, but the social territory in particular. So, okay, yeah. here's, here's the I sense mean. I get from people who are both good at networking and have sort of an unironic love of it. Mm. They're really stoked on themselves and each other. Like that's all there is to it. Like they're all like, like these are the people, especially on Twitter who are constantly praising each other. Like, oh, wow, what a wonderful person, brilliant or amazing. It's like, who are these people and why are they praising each other? Like they're the best people the universe has ever seen. And it makes me want to like blow my brains out. It's like, most of us are not that special. Most of us in sort of our everyday interactions, we're like vaguely interesting, like 5% of the time, 80% of the time, we're kind of boring. 15% of the time, we might be interesting because of, you know, context or situation, or we, are, we happen to be like witness to something interesting. So yeah. all these people who are, for whom networking, yeah, here's what I think happens. This is networking as a, uh, an activity that pretends to have a sort of function and utility, like it's supposedly about something like, you know, um, getting jobs and car leads for sales or, you know, getting something else done beyond just connecting with each other. But for most people who love networking, it's actually just about connecting with other people for its own sake. There's nothing more there, right? So it's like pure, pure social networking. It's like all those, like, uh, uh, Facebook is a really good example. I know you're not super active on it, but I get a huge number of inbound connection requests. And the way I filter them is I see who else I'm connected to in common. So that's a very common filter criteria for me. And some names show up repeatedly for each other. And these are like in the game for the sake of networking type people. And for me, that's now become a negative filter. It's like, if I see any of these 15, 20 names in there, I know this is the network that's growing for the sake of being a network. And I sort of reject that. So uh, <laughs> it's like, if there's an interest graph under there, instead of just a pure social graph, like, all right, here's a network of people interested in Bitcoin. And that, there's a reason to go talk to them, connect to them, learn about Bitcoin, whatever. But this is like, here's a bunch of people who are networking because they're interested in networking. And that's like, there's a certain emptiness there. All right. That's yeah, my I spent so I spent a lot of this this last weekend um, reading rereading some favorite a favorite book from like I want to say from adolescence that um, covers it's called it's a it's a pair of books they're like the young adult fiction category kind of like fantasy um, I think they're called Crown Duel and Court Duel by Sherwood Smith. Um, and it kind of covers this like young woman who like saves her kingdom and has to go to court. And it's got a lot of descriptions of like the social interactions that happen at court. Um, like the being a nobility and having to hang out with all the same people and like the kind of just complete social game <laughs> that being a courtier is. Um, and that sort of reminds me, I feel like networking is a lot like being a courtesan. Um, and that you want to be like, wait, well, wait, like, a courtesan or a courtier? Courtier, I think. I think okay. different. I don't know. Courtesan is a prostitute. <laughs> oh, is it? I didn't know that clearly. <laughs> courtier is somebody who hangs out with nobility and monarchy in the court. Yeah. Okay. So like a the two can overlap a bit. But, <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, that's exactly right. I think being a courtier is a good example of like the vacuous side of networking. Like some of these people are literally called ladies in waiting. That's all they do. They wait around for the higher ranking lady or something. Right. 
So it's like yeah. ladies, like it's there in your title. You are a lady in waiting. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. But like a lot of it is, it's important to be seen and for other people to like know who you are and to be invited to all the parties is very important. Not getting invited to the party is like a big scandal. Um, so like yeah, being connected and in, in like being in, but it's like a totally different game than I feel like the kind of networking that sounds like you appreciate is when you meet someone who has something interesting to offer you. Um, I I feel like I need to point out though that this like approach to networking and like your your sort of like panning of any amount of like the compliment circles that you see happening on mm-hmm. Twitter is a very Scorpio, traditionally <laughs> Scorpio um, personality expression, I think. That could be, that could be. Uh, but you've spent significant time as an outsider in one of the biggest networking for the sake of networking hubs in the world, right? San Francisco. Like oh, yeah. San Francisco annoys the crap out of me just for that. Like All these people are like, so completely into each other and constantly going to each other's meetups and like cuddle puddles or whatever like there's like 15 different things they do and it's like really what do you actually do there like are you really so into each other and you're really so interesting to each other like like what did you think of the san francisco scene since you arrived from the outside and left for texas I I don't know that I did a very good job. I am very much, I think, a um, introvert. Um, I say this like from, you know, I'm work from home and I haven't really noticed the quarantine stuff very much because it didn't really change my life. Um, so I think that my time in San Francisco, I made some really good friends and I met a lot of people through like Twitter networks and such, but I don't really feel like I got caught up in any amount of scene Maybe that's not, I didn't feel very sceny, but. Did you go to a bunch of like meetups or like large group gatherings or did you just like tend to meet up with people one-on-one? I went to some large group gatherings, but it felt more like a bunch of friends hanging out. Okay. Like, I don't know. There's, I I think it qualifies as sort of a networking type event if, um, the mix of uh, people who already know each other versus people who are there to meet other people for the first time, it goes above a certain ratio, like maybe four to one or something. And I should sort of um, not be a hypocrite about this because I have done a lot of like meetup organizing and I ran a conference for uh, six, seven years. And, uh, but in my defense, everything I've organized that's sort of social and stuff you know, it's always been sort of a strong bias of me for me that the meetup or conference or whatever it is has to be about something other than just meeting each other. And uh, so conference is a good one. I mean, you have to have a team, you have to have people giving talks or doing sessions. So it creates that, right? You've been to one refactor camp, right? So there's at least, it's an interest graph. It's not a social graph. And the first few meetups I did that eventually became refactor camp, I was like so paranoid about avoiding networking for the sake of networking that I made them all field trips. Like everything had to be a field trip where people would not just meet to get drinks or talk, but you'd go together somewhere. So we did a tour of like the Sausalito houseboats at one point, and then we went to the computer history museum another time. So uh, I think I have like a strong aversion to the other end of the spectrum. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that being said, I do think it's important to meet people in person. So it's like, I think it's kind of hard. It's like a hard balance, I think, to strike between like making sure you're not building like a a social social only circle, I guess, mm-hmm. um, where but still giving people an opportunity to like hang out. I don't know. This also so this is explaining a lot of the way that you wrapped up the last refactor camp. The only refactor <laughs> camp that was very like this is an airport. You're not here to spend time together. You're here to get in, meet people, and then go on your way to where you're headed. Um, like this is not the destination. This is just the place where you come and kind of pass through a bunch of other people on their way to places. Um, which I feel like I think I feel like that's like actually kind of a good way of like positioning how you your that's like the Venkat um, ideal of networking versus the other where the networking yeah, is a definitely and I think part of the reason I kind of grew 
not exactly disenchanted, but disinterested in continuing refactor camp in the way it was running was over the years between the first to the final one, it became harder and harder to keep it oriented around um, networking for the sake of ideas or interests or something and harder and harder to keep away the stuff that was turning into networking for the sake of networking or this is a scene that I kind of need to enter and connect into. It was like, all right, at this point, it's like not interesting. And I, I kind of lost the motivation to continue it. But um, yeah, while it lasted, I think we kept it pretty healthy on the interest side of the, so the, the spectrum here is interest graph to PR, so PR interest graph to PR social graph. And I think we, everything I've done, I've managed to keep it like strongly biased towards the interest graph end of the spectrum. Oh, that's very interesting that you do that, Kat. Sorry. Yeah. So, the, the, yeah, let's uh, switch to the next topic on the list because I'm really curious about uh, why Nifty? Why is Nifty your Twitter handle? So the topic is Nifty. So tell us about what's Nifty. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny, this is actually the second time I've been asked this this week. And I think before that, it's probably been like maybe 10 years since anyone has ever asked me about it. So um interesting that that's the topic that people want to talk about um yeah I think that like so I as a I think you mean like as a, a nickname right like as a, a self yeah both as a nickname and why you picked it and what you think about things that have the characteristic of being nifty mm, I see okay yeah um so I picked it because I think I think I picked it when I was in high school I've had it since it was like the name of my first blog was like nifty and I um it was on Vanga. Okay. I don't know. Anyways, um, I think I have a copy of that blog somewhere still. I need to make sure I still have that. Anyways, um, yeah, so I picked it because like I think at the time in high school, for whatever reason, I was going through this phase where I was like I had like favorite words and there were I think I only had two favorite words. One was persnickety. Um <laughs> just I like the way it sounds. Like I'm really into the way things sound. Um and nifty. I like nifty for I like nifty because I think it sounds nifty and the fact that nifty is like self-describing that way like it's nifty and it sounds nifty and so like mm -hmm. like I like I like the nifty is a nifty there. word yeah. um, and then it like my last name's Nigat, so nifty nigh kind of has this nice rhyme to it so that's that's where it came from was the sounding of it um uh yeah so nifty things um name like 10 words. nifty things words are nifty um i think words that sound cool are nifty like nifty um uh you know it's actually interesting so i think i'm going to take this somewhere that maybe is a little weird um a few weeks ago i think someone on twitter i can't remember who was posting about the fact that they had found a marshall McLuhan set of cards so he had made um and i think they're just normal playing cards like the 52 card deck um, is it 52? I think. Anyways, and um, he, each of them had like a different like slogan on it from McLuhan. And I kind of got into a bit of like an argument. I don't know, argument, but just like, uh, McLuhan, is he really all that great? Like, he just kind of has these like meaningless slogans that he puts out there. They're not even like Cohen's, because they're like, there's like a difference between like a Zen Cohen and a slogan. And these like definitely fall into sloganeering is my thing. Um, and so I, the person I was like kind of like <laughs> in their mentions, like going through this whole like anti-McLuhan, anti-sloganeering like tribe posted this really interesting thesis or PhD that someone had written about McLuhan's like greater body of work. I've never read any McLuhan um, that actually had this really interesting way of like I call, it's called like the triptych um mm -hmm. the so it's like a triptych and the whole idea with it is that there's like kind of mapping back I want to say to ancient Greek uh is this am I taking this the right way I can't remember if this is something I came up with or what I read in the paper but um the whole idea is that there's like three types of ways that you can talk there's like grammarians that focus on um like words and how they sound. And McLuhan really puts himself in as a grammarian. There's logicians that are um, logical. So like that's the um, logic is kind of the, if this, then that, like the mm -hmm. um, 
constructive flow of what you can build using language. And then there's, I think the third one, I want to say, this is where I get confused about whether I was like making something up or this is actually something I read in the paper. But I think the third one was um, it's logic, grammar, and then there's something else. It, I want to say it was like rhetoric, like rhetor rhetorician. Uh, are you talking about the three aspects of rhetoric, which is um, uh, logos, uh, ethos, and pathos? So pathos would be emotional appeal? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I really else. thought it was like, because one of them was grammar. It was like grammar. I think I thought it was grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that or logic. Anyways, I have to go look up the paper. I'll put a link in the tweet thing for it. But I thought it was really mm -hmm. interesting that like, um, to kind of like understand that, that like it's, it's, it was really interesting to have this like definition of like grammarian being kind of like the, almost like, I don't know if syntax is the right word for it, but like um, just like the the feeling of the words themselves and the way that they're like okay. together and like like nittiness is like a good example of that because it's like it's like what does it as a word like sound like and like the flow of them it's like almost a poeticism yep. that um, which makes sense because like logic logicians aren't poetic like they don't deal with poeticism and I feel like rhetoric isn't poetic either Re rhetoric is using words for like a different purpose it's using words for the purpose of persuasion or like creating like a, a ideology or like a fantasy right grammarians what they like about words is like the the musicality of them and how you can like put them together logicians look at words and they like how you Got can construct yeah. like tight like the uh, so, uh, so the concept of like, uh, what's it called, prosody or prosody? I don't know how it's pronounced, P R O S O D Y, but that's like how words flow in poetry, but gen more generally applied to any kind of text. So that's what you're getting yeah. at, right? Right, and so like, right, and so as soon as you like understand McLuhan as a grammarian, his sloganeering makes complete sense. Oh, he's yeah. just <laughs> making things that like sound. I was like, so I was like, oh, I get what he's doing now. He's a sloganeer. Like he likes he likes putting words together that sound cool. Like the medium of the message is like a hundred percent like a grammarian statement. Like it's not, it's not a logical, it's not a rhetoric thing. It's not a, it's like, it, it's like the perfect explanation or like example of what a grammaric like word usage <laughs> is. is I, feel, I feel incredibly subtweeted right now because I think that's how <laughs> I see myself and a lot of people see me as, uh, actually, somebody actually accused me of this in grad school that in conversations, I'm always looking for the punchline, which could be, you know, alliterative or any other sort of punchy, verbally sort of um, popping out way of saying something. So I think, uh, yes, there's definitely an element of that to McLuhan, uh, though I do think you're, um, I don't know, giving him, like you're selling him short a little. But by the way, you just did a very nifty thing right now, which is, we are on N and we've gone past M, which would be, have been the right place to discuss McLuhan. And I think you know that I'm a McLuhan fan, so you kind of finessed it and made sure <laughs> I couldn't do a defense. So I'll have to wait another 26 episodes before I can defend <laughs> properly. But yeah, what are some other things that are nifty? So you've got like, yeah, that kind of wordplay, the word nifty itself. What are some nonverbal things that are nifty? Nonverbal things. So I think that's the thing about niftiness is that, well, okay. What else would I put in nifty? Oh, I think that, so I think another nifty aspect or like thing would be um, curation. Um, I think that like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm using this as like a thing I find nifty or a thing that as a nifty person I like seek to do. I don't know that I do a very good job on it on Twitter. Um, but I do think that like, I do think that like one thing that, is increasingly important in a world where like information is like incredibly available is the ability to pull out um tell stories by like curating it or um it's not even necessarily tell stories about it but it's like the ability to find cool and interesting maybe niche things that like exist but we get lost in the noise without someone going through and pulling it out and being like these are cool valuable things and when you put them together in a um in a set or as a collection um it it gives it something else or um 
Yeah, it kind of like you kind of do tell a story or create a worldview through what you've decided to highlight out of like the vast morass of like books, for example. So a, a library collection is a form of curation, um, which is like cool. Uh, I think it like so <sighs> when I worked at Etsy, I actually got in a really huge argument. It was like the biggest. I was like super drunk, and oh, it was that's like that's right. You used to work at Etsy, and Etsy is like basically full of people selling nifty little things, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, lots of nifty things. But like, how do you... So, the, okay, but here's the thing about Etsy and like one of its big problems that it's had, I think even recently, and it's been a problem. It's, it's definitely... So I worked at Etsy from 2012 to 2014. So before it IPO'd, um, I got in when it was like the fun last like happy stages of being like a private company um, mm -hmm. and then left right before they IPO'd. So... Um, the problem with Etsy that was starting to get have a big problem is there's a lot of really cool stuff on the site, but it's not all easy to see. So that's like a really, it's like kind of a small garden version of the same problem that I think exists other places. Um, and the one way that like, so there, it's kind of, it was like, I think it was sort of semi-problematic for reasons, but one way that, so on the front page of Etsy, what do you show? You have to show something, right? So back in the day, Etsy had this like way that you could create a list of a thing and you could only put 12 things on it and they were called treasuries. So you could make as many treasuries as you wanted, but it was limited in the number of items that you could have in them. Um, and then the best, I don't know how the best, I don't know if people like upvoted them or somehow like the best, there was a way to like surface good treasuries, like that were good curated collections of items from Etsy with cool stuff in it. Um, and the someone would pick, I think the Etsy curators, so Etsy actually employed people that curated the website, right? So things mm -hmm. like what went on the front page and what did we write articles about and what did we showcase and that kind of thing. Um, and they would pick every hour, I think, it would change which treasury was featured on the front page. And this was like, I mean, it was really big if you were selling stuff, if your treasury ended up on the front page. So like a mini industry started of people, not industry, but like, rings networks of people that were um all making treasuries with each other's items on them in the hopes that one of those collections would get surfaced oh. and then end up on the front page so that, that's like a mining pool for bitcoin <laughs> i'm right? sorry can you say that again like you know, what you explained last time for how mining pools um, work right so yeah. you have a share in a pool and if any of them wins you get a share of it so it's a little bit like a mining pool for attention on the front page 100 percent. that's like the perfect analogy yes yes anyway so, so like so there were it was problematic but when i was there there was this particular product manager slash engineer engineer product manager guy who was his project was to get rid of treasuries and create something called lists and so they were never going to have no longer going to be treasuries they're going to be lists lists were going to be wonderful and great because you could put as many things as you wanted onto them um, there was no limits. You could just like add whatever you wanted. It would solve this problem of people keeping lots of things in their shopping cart. Cause I don't know about you, but one way that I use Etsy, even though I know people don't like it, people being the engineers who run Etsy is like, I'll put things I want in my cart and then later go through and decide what <laughs> I want to buy. Cause it's like all this, like you just put it in your cart and then you go through and like look through and be like, uh -huh. no, no, I don't really have budget for this. Like anyways, they're like, no, we'll make lists and people will put them in lists. Um, so that was like the big project and I got, I found out about this at some point. I got really drunk and really mad and or like just kind of like upset. <laughs> I was like, why? It was like, it was like Christmas week or like the week of Christmas holidays. So everyone in the office was very drunk. I was fine. Um, but I definitely like had like two hours of like, I don't know, I would call it yelling, but just being like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Why are you getting rid of these treasuries? Like, look at all the cool curatorial <laughs> content that we're getting from free from all these people. And the guy was like, no, that's not really, that's, but that's, I'm like, but free work. We're getting all this free work from all of these like community members who are like very invested. And anyways, um, yeah, so curation is nifty. I'm very into curation. There's an interesting tension though, because nifty to me has connotations of like small and quick tricks mm -hmm. and curation is actually a little bit of a slog but i can see where you're getting that in this particular case like a collection of 12 things that you put together in a treasury as an object that's nifty yeah. uh, but uh, as a sort of 
lifestyle habit curating is not nifty. It's like too much work to be considered nifty. When I think of like work, so shifting from nifty as an adjective for nouns to nifty as an adjective to like behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of like nifty little tricks, like that, those are two words that go to go off and together, right? Nifty trick. And that usually means something small and clever and um, like, uh, oh, uh, here's an example. Let me see if I can show it to you. Uh, I have, I don't know if you can see it, but I have a little binder clip that I've used to uh, clip a cable to my inbox tray. Uh, so that it doesn't keep sliding off. And that I think of as a nifty little trick. So the, people have those kinds of little tricks all over the place, right? So that, so to me, those two are the words that go together very strongly, nifty and trick. And curation is not a trick. It's like a proof of work mining mm. protocol, right? Uh, yeah, I think it is a little bit of a proof of work. That's, that's interesting, huh? That's cool. so, so curation, oh, I so- hacks. I love hacks. Oh yeah. Okay. So hacks are nifty. Yeah, I think hacks are nifty. I feel like the most recent thing that I'm the most proud of, well, maybe there's a couple, this is like six months old at this point, but I figured out how to like reverse engineer some like clickers I have. So both like one clicker will open the garage and the gate, which is exciting. Um, I don't know. It took me like, <laughs> it took me like an hour of digging through stuff and I had to take the other remote apart, but I figured it out. It's like very, now it's like, it went from being like two clunky things to one little nifty that might almost be the prototype of a nifty thing yeah that's exactly yeah, exactly the kind of thing i would so consider great. Nifty. I'm so happy i'm like i'm still excited <laughs> it was six months ago and i'm like i think i've done more things since then i'm not really sure but it's definitely the thing i'm like most excited to tell people about it's like yeah and I think there's an element of reusability as well. Like anytime you come up with like a nifty pattern of either behavior or nouns or whatever, you can reuse it a lot. Like when you discover a nifty trick, you tend to keep reusing it. It kind of fits in your little toolkit. Um, Do you have, so speaking of nifty tricks, is there a nifty trick that you have happened upon lately that you're, that you like or like that you would want to talk about? I think this is one of the areas where I'm not very creative at all. So mm -hmm. I tend not to have a good eye for nifty things and collecting them and using them regularly. But I tend to notice when other people do and uh, use them when um, I can. Uh, uh, hmm. I, I guess the, the typical kind of uh, uh, level of creativity I bring to nifty behaviors is like taking screenshots of things and that's not at all nifty so that you know it's like just screenshotting bits of text from books and websites and stuff and that to me is like an annoying uh, keyboard shortcut I learned at some point and uh, so it's it, 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 what I'm getting at is I'm not a nifty person I'm like very not nifty and that's the level at which I can actually operate Whereas a lot of other people are very much more creative. Like I would never think to do what you did, which is combine two clickers into one, even though that's a very nifty trick. It's great. It's kind of funny though, that your nifty trick of taking screenshots has to do with curation. Like you're taking your nifty okay. trick is around the-, the But it's very cheap and easy curation. So it's just living in my screenshots folder. I, it's not very thoughtful. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that's hmm. interesting. I feel like the, the other most nifty thing I did is figuring out how to like, so I don't know if you've noticed the the cage is done. Did we talk, we talked yeah, about yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I think we it's talked about it a really... um, couple of times ago. Yeah, I think it was still getting built at the time, but it's finished now. I'm sleeping in it. You're safe from 5G radiation. I don't know if I'm safe. <laughs> I don't think I'm safe. My phone still works inside of it. So I don't think it like cuts things out entirely. It does make the bars go down, which was the whole point. So it's like definitely reduces the ability of like signals to get to me. I think um, I haven't gotten like a, there's like machines you can use that will register um, whatever you call it, like field wavelength intensity. strength. Yeah. Um, but they're very expensive. I need to figure out how to like beg borrow or steal one for a weekend to like be able to like run some tests with it. Or but, make um, a nifty little device that'll do it for you. Well, I thought my phone was going to do it for me, but my <laughs> phone is telling me that like, no, you didn't do a great job. So at this point I would kind of just want to know like what the differential is, like how great, like it, it, like it tells me it, 
it's really obvious if you manage to cut off all communication. I've clearly managed to like reduce it, but I don't know by how much. And so I need like a finer grain tool to like do the, that at all. But I was very proud of the way that I figured out how to close it because you need to shut it, right? At some point, um, I use like, anyways, I don't know if this is interesting, but I ended up using, do I have any here? Hang on. Uh, no. Oh yeah. I use magnet tape. I covered it with conductive, um, I magnet taped the sides. Wow, okay. Yeah, so like on one side of the bed, there's like magnet tape running along it and the screen has <laughs> magnet on it. And then, so magnets aren't, but so what you need is you need a conductive plane all the way around, right? So then I have, um, I have conductive tape. <laughs> <laughs> it's got conductive glue on the inside and this is also conductive. So when you put it over the the magnets and the magnets touch, then you have two conductive planes touching each other and they make a good like little seal. So I have And you, since your conducting <laughs> tape is golden in color, you've got yeah. like nice little golden accents on your uh, cage. Exactly. Yes. So it's, a, it's a, I think I like when I told you about it a few months ago, I think I I I thought I kind of overshot. I told you I was building an aesthetic, um, aesthetic Faraday cage, and then I started building it. And it wasn't very pretty. Like the first few versions I got together looked fairly ugly. Um, and I got a little afraid, like a little worried that I had told you I was going to make this aesthetic thing, and that was like totally failing. But it actually does look fairly nice now. Yeah, I mean, you've got basically a bed-sized golden tin foil hat. Yes, so that works that perfectly for you, right? <laughs> Locks out 5G and you need all the backport cred you need. Yeah, it's great. I actually do think I've been sleeping better, but I don't know. Like I wake up and I don't feel as like muddle headed. I don't know if that's yeah, placebo. Because... It's total placebo effect. <laughs> <laughs> but is it my cat? No one knows. I think so. No one knows. Um, all right. Yeah. Do we have time for one more topic? Yeah, we have time for one more topic. Um, what do we have? Do we want to talk about, we have neighbors and native sons. Would you rather, let's talk about neighbors. You pick. Okay, neighbors. Venkat, I hear you have some, did you, did you ever resolve your neighbor problems? No, we didn't. So I've been ranting on Twitter quite a bit about my neighbor. He plays loud music and he fights with his girlfriend and uh, like it, it started before COVID. So uh, one time I went and knocked and uh, sort of told him to turn it down. Then I did it a second time. Then COVID happened and nobody wants to get in each other's faces with the pandemic going. So I did one more kind of passive aggressive thing. I left a note on his door and a couple of times I banged on his wall. But at some point I gave up because the uh, apartment management basically is like uh, doing a take it slow approach to any non-critical complaint. So it's mm. like, they're not going to respond and uh, I'm not going to actually pick a physical fight with my neighbor. He looks uh, bigger than me, like he could beat me up. So I don't want to actually get into that fight. Plus, um, overhearing his fights with his girlfriend, um, he seems like a little bit of a violent guy. So I don't want to uh, get into it. That, that, that was actually, uh, mm. I don't want to like cast aspersions here, but for a while, overhearing him my wife and I were both wondering is he abusive is he beating her or something but it never became clear but she threatened to leave him a couple of times and I think uh, came back each time and we're like all right these two are meant for each other so I don't know what the hell's going on but anyway that's my neighbor's story it's not a pleasant neighbor story and I now would like a mansion with no neighbors as we discussed last time how much of this neighbor thing is what spurred your mansion <laughs> it might have had more of a role to play than I'm admitting to myself because the timing is suspicious. My interest in mansions <laughs> exploded about the time I started in conflict with this guy. So yeah, but, but I think um, it, it's been brewing for a while, my interest in mansions. But you have yeah. a much better neighbor than I do. So you have a better neighbor story to tell than I do, right? So what's your neighbor story? My neighbor story. Yeah, my neighbors are great. I mean, we all live really close together. Oh, no, you other native son's story of a famous person. In Houston. Did, yeah. We'll get to that. Let's uh, talk neighbors. Yeah. So you have one shared wall with a condo neighbor? I have one shared wall. I never hear them. Yeah, oh, um, perfect. 
I would assume they never hear me, but they haven't heard from them either way. So I'm assuming it's fine. Um, I Do you play live... loud music? No. Oh, okay. Um, no, <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't know. Do you do um, any like heavy hammering and so you do a lot of DIY hacker stuff oh, and yeah. hardware stuff, right? So do you do a lot of loud hammering or jackhammers and things like that? No jackhammers. I do hammer stuff from time to time, but never on that wall. Like the, just because of the way the apartment is set up, I haven't had to touch that wall at all and ah, probably okay. won't. I mean, when I'm hanging up pictures on it, like I don't do it after like nine o'clock at night because that's okay. nice neighborly thing to do, I guess. Um, <laughs> I do like, so Jane Jacobs actually had interesting things to say about neighbors. Um, I can't remember which book it was in. I want, I think it was in, I'm pretty sure it's in Death and Life of Great American Cities. Um, but she, her whole thing about neighbors, I think I kind of took sort of to heart is that you should never be on very good terms with them. Like it's, you all want to like, <laughs> like never get enough terms that you're friendly like never become friends with your neighbors is the whole Jane Jacobs slash like New York City kind of ethos like you want to like be nice and polite and trusting of each other but never really maybe you know each other's first names but never anything beyond that because like you have to live next to these people and it's like much better for everyone if you just pretend like you don't exist once you disappear into your apartment um, and you don't have, like, it's almost like the opposite of networking, right? Like networking yeah, is all know. about like going out and meeting people and getting to this like social, like pretending like you do have a social relationship with them. Um, good neighbors, at least the Janesian uh, uh, philosophy on neighborhood n neighborisms would be like the opposite of networking, which is like that you like don't want to know them. You don't want to have them in your Rolodex. Like maybe like even to the point where I think like if you had a thing and you needed like so you you would want to like know it would be more important that you are on good terms with your neighborhood bar so if ever, anyone ever needed to like come pick up your apartment keys you would leave them behind like the bar would have the keys behind the counter huh. and someone could come in and get the keys from the bartender and go up to your apartment and that they wouldn't have to like that that would be your focal point of stuff rather than like anyone you lived anywhere close to. Um, That's kind of fascinating because I had the opposite of impression of um, Jane Jacobs uh, from sort of casually reading around her work, like the idea that you want like highly mixed residential and commercial neighborhoods and multiple age groups. Part of it is security, like the next door grandparents can watch your kid kind of thing. But I can see the logic of what you're saying because you don't want to be too friendly with your neighbors. So I can f see why she would recommend that because you want to leave enough sort of distance, like social distance between you to be able to pick a fight if you need to. Like if you're too friendly, it's like you can't call them out on shit and say, put your garbage out or like stop making noise after 11 p.m. or whatever, right? So there's that piece. And what you said just reminded me of um, like um, a Seinfeld episode where this is the topic. Uh, did you ever watch much Seinfeld? Okay, I've seen so like you half of it. I'm like halfway through it. You remember the episode where Kramer decides that the building needs to be a lot more friendly. So he wants to take everybody's photo and put them up. And Jerry's like, no way. And then he gets ostracized because he's the only one sitting out the attempt to make everybody friendly, right? <laughs> and that's, I think, both particularly classic New York, but kind of true everywhere. Like, I wouldn't want that at all. And, and yeah, this could be exactly. why like attempts to create social networking sort of sites around building communities have pretty mm -hmm. much failed. Not only does management not want to encourage that because then the you know, tenants can band up against the management, but the tenants themselves probably do not want that. They kind of want this slightly hostile social condition where they can rat on each other and sort of spy on each other and be nasty to each other a bit. Yeah, like everything that I hear, I don't, well, I feel like Drew Austin, like I think he's at Kneeling Bus on Twitter, has had some recent tweets about how his his next door community is like very like um, chill. Like they seem to post like things about animals or something, like exciting things about the animals in that neighborhood. But most of other, aside from like those tweets that I've seen aside, most of what I see come out of next door, like the parts that bubble up into Twitter, like kind of horror stories or like, like, you know, like point of next door is that you do get to know your neighbors and you have like a way of communicating with them. Um, I think our apartment, like this little 
group of townhomes tried to like organize something that we'd have like a more like I think someone's tried to start an X core group and I was I personally was just like email's great if you need to get me here's my email <laughs> like I will be able to respond to you probably within a week like <laughs> wow <laughs> I, I have heard a lot of horror stories about like next door type communities and other sites um, going bad. Like often uh, like Oakland and Berkeley had a bunch of stories about uh, people turning into like neighborhood watch cops, but um, in sort of uh, like being the local racist Karen who calls out like if a black guy is wandering through the neighborhood that gets posted on next door or Facebook or something. So I've heard a lot of that kind of story. But on the other hand, I think uh, uh, situations like right now with the protests and uh, rioting and things like that, people do band together in like strong neighborhood communities. Like um, Jordan, a friend of mine in Minneapolis, he pulled together a 300 person Discord server for his um, neighborhood. And people have copied the pattern and they're like doing that in several areas near him. So it's like, but, uh, but again, that fits your Jay and Jacobs pattern of you want to know them well enough to trust them and um, stuff, but you don't want to make them your friends because you want to like coordinate and cooperate with them and maybe fight with them, but you may not necessarily want to hang out with them. I think that like, I think part of the key thing about not getting too close is that you never get to the question about where your politics lie, if that makes sense. Oh, you yeah. never get to the point where, you never get to the point where you find out enough about the other person to figure out what you think of them or to like develop an opinion about how you do or do not exactly get along with them as a person. As, as long as you never get to like a personal level with them, like you can coexist with a lot of people. Um, and like, so it's just a matter of like, there's like this very like polite veneer that like we exist on the polite veneer level. And like, like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that I'm sure one of the people in this apartment complex like has totally different politics than I am. And we never have to decide, discover that we don't agree on those things because we will never have, there will never be the opportunity for us to have that conversation, right? I think that's kind of like- so that's, I think that's exactly the um, sort of uh, failure mode of um, social communities because it sort of um, pulls the veil of that uh, mutual ignorance, right? Like mm -hmm. the moment somebody in your neighborhood uh, sort of like to take an extreme case, the, what was that, the Aubrey case, the guy who got shot, uh, while jogging by a couple of guys in a pickup truck. That was, do you, you know the case I'm talking about? I think it's Aubrey. Uh, but yeah, that was a bunch, like the guy who was taking the video was I think a neighbor of the two guys who shot him. And the whole premise was um, a kind of Trayvon uh, Martin type of like neighborhood watch kind of like stand your ground scenario or some, that kind of like um, neighborhood defense context or something. But the point is when something like that happens in your neighborhood, it's sort of like, uh, makes it impossible to pretend that everybody has like uh, you, that you don't need to know each other's politics. So it doesn't have to be that particular kind of incident. It can be any other kind of incident, right? Like that's why uh, neighborhood uh, uh, law and political science uh, uh, becomes such a fraught issue. Like uh, in the last election, I was hearing about like very Trumpy towns where everybody had a Trump sign on their front yard. And the few people who didn't support Trump felt intimidated enough that they didn't put up anything because that was like marking yourself for come vandalize me or whatever. And I'm sure the similar thing might be true in liberal neighborhoods, right? If you're the only Trump supporter in a group of like 50 heavily liberal people and you put up a Trump sign, you're putting like a you know, target on your back. So it's like neighborhoods are places where you don't want to put target on your back because everybody knows where you live. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so it's like, I mean, that is like some amount of privacy, right? Like it's like, it's a privacy preservation tactic. It's not because you don't want to be friendly with them. It's because it's like everyone, like it's like this generalized ideal that everyone deserves their own privacy to like, to think what they want and have their own opinions about things without having to really worry about the people in their direct vicinity right so like I mean I think that this is a little bit of like a tragedy of the like commons or the tragedy of living in like a large community to some extent is that like what it means in order for all of us to live together does mean some amount of like alienation right um because people talk about how how cities can be really like lonely and I think this is one of the reasons why is that part of the coping mechanism of being able to like live in large communities is that 
there is some amount of like impersonality that you need in order for them to be like sustainable. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. It's the reason in the 19th century, everybody who hated like life in a small town or village and where everybody was in each other's faces, they all kind of fled to the big city the moment they could. And you still see that. Like you talk to people in any big city, they're like, I couldn't wait to get out of whatever little town or village I grew up in, right? So you hear a lot of stories like that. Uh, but there's another way sort of the fiction of not knowing each other can break down these days is uh, because celebrity is so cheap now, so many people can easily be famous on at least a small level that um, it becomes harder to hide behind the anonymity. Like if you're, uh, I don't know, uh, like a famous Hollywood star like Brad Pitt, of course, you'll be recognized wherever you go. But most of us have this sort of uh, anonymity and obscurity kind of like um, strategy, right? Which doesn't hold when more and more people have at least modest um, levels of um, uh, sort of, you know, fame or ill fame or whatever. Like a friend of mine in Austin, um, I think you met him, Brandon Hudgens. Um, he m mentioned that he saw Alex Jones uh, walking around his uh, neighborhood and he didn't know that Alex Jones lived near him. And that's the, like Alex Jones is, he's still super famous. He's like uh, tier B media, right? He's not a major television network, but he's like next level, right? But you can take that down. Like, um, uh, like oh yeah, an example I can think of is uh, <laughs> my wife follows a woman on Instagram who seems to live somewhere in our neighborhood and posts about like apartment stuff. So if you're an Instagram person who posts about like home stuff, you can't hide and suddenly everybody knows who you are and people are interested in the neighborhood can follow you. So I think social media might be breaking down this Jane Jacobs uh, sort of approach to keeping neighborhoods stable by making sure like, you know, you're not too close to anybody or even knowing names. Like most of us don't know the names of uh, any of our neighbors in uh, like this neighbor have a running fight with. I know I don't know his name. I know more about him than I'm going to reveal because uh, I think I could figure it out if I wanted to. Uh, but yeah, I don't know his name. Like I have this running fight with him for several months, but I don't know his name. <laughs> the unnamed enemy. Like, yep. uh, <laughs> um, I was going to say, so I wanted to make a small comment about your Instagram thing. You do live in LA. So the fact that you can like see the Instagram person in your neighborhood is a very, I think, LA <laughs> uh Oh yeah, in LA from just walking around, it almost sometimes seems like one in every three or four people is some sort of minor Instagram person. Like they're all over the freaking place. Like you go walking, especially in the more touristy parts like the Santa Monica Pier. Like the first time I walked there, like not the first time, but the first time in recent years, like actually last year at Refactor Camp. So this was after like nearly 10 years. The last time I'd been on the pier was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But this time, the striking difference I noticed was the number of people like um, taking like videos and Instagram photos of themselves. And you could tell that they were doing it for like social media broadcasts because some of them were holding it on a selfie stick and like doing a little spiel. And it's like this peer has like six of these people doing it at the same time. And like the whole world has become a stage and everybody is literally a player on the stage. You know, okay, so I want to like, something that is like thinking, um, occurring to me as you're talking about the social media stuff and how it seems like everyone and their mother is like a social media star, right? Okay, so let's say you had like 5 million people and each one of them, for whatever reason, was followed every other one, right? So each oh, of them wow. had an audience of 5 million people and each of them had like their own thing that they did on social media, but if all of them have 5 million viewers, do you still get the same amount of like money that you get in terms of like, is it still like profitable? Like, well, we'll of course we'll not. I mean, this is where it connects to the networking thing and also to your nifty Etsy list thing, right? Because if you spread the same attention over 5 million items, then it might as well be stranger. Like you, nobody can possibly keep up with 5 million people at a That's level true. worth enough to like, you know, give them either direct money or advertising dollars. Same thing. Like when, you were arguing, I think correctly, about getting rid of like a 12 item treasure chest and replacing it with like an arbitrarily long list. You've kind of ruined the game because the whole game is if you ha have to choose 12 items, the attention becomes valuable, the curation becomes valuable. Uh, same thing with networking, right? If you get to connect, if, if you're one of like, um, say, 
10 bloggers that a uh, rich or famous person have connected to, that's worth something. But if it's like a rich and famous person who says yes to like everybody, then it's worth less. So there's like almost a scarcity economy there. But uh, yeah. So, okay, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. So, and, and inevitably what ends up happening is even if you start out with like almost a baby's brain, like baby's brains are this way, like all the neurons are connected to each other and as it, it matures, the connections that aren't used are broken. So it's like programming, a, what do you call it? An FPGA type um, chip, mm -hmm. right? So you burn the connections you don't want. I think that's kind of the regime we are getting to with social networking. Like a few hundred years ago, you're sort of available set for people to network with was your town or village. Like there'd be like, you know, a few hundred people and you had to pick like a dozen people you cared about and ignore the rest. Now in principle, you could start off with at least a nominal connection with like tens of thousands of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. There are people I know on Twitter who literally seem to follow a hundred thousand other people. And I'm like, how do you do that? But the point is you can start off with hundreds or thousands of connections that are nominally there, but really literally are not there because they get too little share of your, you know, time, uh, time division bandwidth to be useful. So then people start deciding, all right, in principle, I'm connected to everybody, but who do I in fact actually pay attention to? And everybody else is de facto not connected to you. And in here, this is why, you know, algorithmic platforms are so powerful because they get to shove themselves in your choices there. Like they show you more of one person or the other. So, yeah. Yeah, That's I mean, it does are. the curation for you, right? Like it, it, it has become the curator. Like, yeah. uh, and it's kind of weird. Like um, I follow maybe 900 people on Twitter, uh, but it's kind of weird what the algorithm decides to show me more or less of. And it's not a function of how active of a tweeter they are. So I think some extent it's sort of benevolent algorithmic um, intervention, like people I respond to more, it might show me more of. But a lot of it is, they're probably manipulating who I see based on what makes their ad algorithms work better or something unrelated like that. I wish this was like very easy to find out. I wish there was like a, I wish there was like a rubric that was printed, right? Or that like, I wish like, cause that would be like that level of transparency. Well, it'd probably make it easier to game. I don't know. I don't know, but it would be nice to know. Like maybe just tell me like, Hey Jack, like, let me know. Like, we're in the network. No, I, I don't shake, think I shake uh, Jack's hand. Like he knows me. We're friends now, right? Like, uh, I think ten years ago you could have made that work because the algorithms were simple enough. Like the yeah. first Google algorithm, page rank. You can read the paper about it, and it's like understandable. Mm. But by the time you get to a mature platform like that's fifteen, twenty years old, and got, it's got like a huge bunch of machine learning, and it's like picking up on factors that even the designers don't know about. Yeah the idea of like making the workings of an algorithm legible it becomes equal to the problem of making ai explainable right so it becomes it's not legible though it's making them visible right okay yeah visible is a start and there is a necessary condition <laughs> but ultimately you want uh, legibility because you want to be able to understand what you're seeing right so even if they show you like all the ways suppose it's a machine learning algorithm and they show you all right this are, these are the signals we train on these are the weights on the uh, deep learning network, you tell me why the algorithm is doing what it's doing. So it's almost given big platforms a get out of jail free card because if, when it comes to like trying to explain or justify what the AI is doing, they kind of don't have to unless it does something really unconscionable. Like, you know, if it's exhibiting clear bias, then the courts might say you can't do that for employment or whatever. But otherwise, if it's like, we don't know what this mysterious algorithm is doing and how it's deciding what tweets to show you, there's no legal right being violated and we can't explain it, but here's all our data and, or even, you know, all our algorithmic details. So anyway, I think we are going to see all that come to meet space as well. So neighborhoods are going to have algorithmic, you know, neighborhood algorithms. Yeah, you might be right. All right. Black well, we should, we should probably wrap it up. I think we've hit, we hit three ends today. Three ends, um, yes. Three ends. All right. Great. Well, Venkat, is always a pleasure. Um, thanks for hanging out. Always a show. pleasure. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one-hitters. 
check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.